thanks for joining me today. And I want to start with a disclaimer. Uh, last Tuesday, I didn't know that I'll be in Dublin today. Uh, there was like a last minute cancellation and they called me and say that a talk that I submitted six months ago need to be delivered in a week. Uh, so I planned a lot of card samples, etc. but instead of that, you'll get memes and jokes. Uh, I hope you'll be fine with that. But to be more interactive, I prepare a question that I want you to answer. And I'm fine that you're listening to me with the phone in your hand, because that's the same that I do. Um, so if you could only take one action to improve your application security, what would it be? And the reason I'm asking that question is that I think there is one thing we can streamline uh, for have better application security. Uh, so we'll go to that answer uh, in the end of my talk and let's see how is it going. So we are celebrating 20 years this year in 2023 to the OWASP top 10 list in 20, 2023. 2003, there was the first OWASP top 10 list published. And 20 years later, I just tried to look on the both list and comparing them tell me a story. And the story is about how our application shifted over the years, or for the last 20 years, uh, from the difference between the lists. So if we look at 2003, we can see buffer overflow and error handling and a, a denial of service that was on the list. The reason they are not there anymore because we externalize services that was part of our application that now run as a service. We are not afraid of denial of service because you, we are using CDN and like a web application firewall. We are not afraid of buffer overflow because we are auto scaling. We are running on container instead of machines. And if I look at uh, 2023, I can see that new items comes in, insecure design and security misconfiguration, but that's related to environments. So we are externalizing environments or taking them to the code. And also if we look, for example, in 2003, we have three items that were related to uh, things that today is only one thing on the list. So today we have injection, but back then we have three items on the list for injection. What changed? Again, we are externalizing services, but we want them to be declared inside our code, right? But one, cha one thing never changed over the, week, the years. What is the most effective way to avoid insecure application? And that never changed because the way is to do not deploy it. Right? If we will not deploy insecure application, our application will always be secure. So back again in the days, who remember that screen? Well, so this spectacular FTP window was part of every person who does deployment back in 2003. Right? And what an amazing day this was because we have one folder for all of all our code. We have one credential that can deploy everything. And we can think that was secure, right? Because that credential was strong. But we all know that situation. So you need to deploy something on weekend. You don't have the credentials because you're just junior developer as I was. But then your manager said, oh, okay, it's urgent. I'll give you the credentials, but please only the single PHP file that you could, please, please. Well. So that's not secure. And you can think maybe we are in a better days today, right? Because we have all these DevSecOps. So look, it, back like 10 years ago, I think that none of the tools here were exist, right? We have uh, today on the software development lifecycle so much automated tools that help us to have better, de better deployment for our application to whatever it ran or stored or whatever it is. But that's not secure. And the reason for that, 
we need to understand the typical structure of today's um, code organization. And if we speak about the organization, so I'll speak about myself. So my name is Gabriel. I am today doing DevRel in a startup called Permit. Permit is a startup that do full stack of solutions for authorization. We have like low code solution for application authorization, but also supporting a extensive infrastructure of policy as code. And our GitHub organization look like this one. So first we have our backend repository. Okay. What we have in our backend repository, so we are deploying multiple microservices. Today we have seven microservices. We do also have some internal, uh, let's call it DevOps services that do stuff inside our uh, architecture. We do have third party dependencies like Redis, and we do have also customized dependencies because we need, you know, to shift a bit the charts that deployed, etc. And then we have a lot of configuration for infra for cloud services in infrastructure as code. So we configure our secret managers, CDN, etc. So we look at this one repository and we find that we have more than 10 deployment points. So think about it like launch facilities. We have one repository and we can think that there is one CI CD process, but there is more than 10 deployment points in one repository. And it not ends here. We also um, maintain an open source tool called Opal. Opal is open policy administration layer, which also ran as part of our backbone product. And then we are deploying the Opal package to PyPy, the Python registry. We are deploying server and client Docker images to Docker um, registry. And we also have canary versions because we want to test the version before we deploy them in that backbone, in our backbone. So here, more couple of deployment points. And we also have feature flags. So deployment point is not end-to-end -end point. Deployment point can be multiple deployment points because we want part of the deployment to go to one environment or one registry to one version and a different branches to go to deploy to a different environment and registries. And that continue. We have a front-end repository, which also has deployment point uh, to a static registry, but also to uh, debugging environment. We have some sidecars that we maintain for our growth, which is uh, open source small tools. And we have SDKs because we are a dev tool. We have like, I think today, seven SDKs that we're maintaining, seven deployment points. And we have um, repositories of infrastructure as code for customers that needs a private environment. So we have, for example, a med tech customer that want private environment. So we are maintaining how its infrastructure looks in code repository. So that's mean one organization can have more than 50 deployment points. And you'll say again, Okay, but I'm fine. You have all the DevSecOps and I'm pretty sure you are a startup, so you're all automated and you're CI, CD. But this whisper stayed the same. Some developer on the weekend get a bug from a customer and then he say, okay, I'll look at the CI, CD uh, infrastructure and see how could I deploy myself the NPM package. And I know that I have a uh, read permission to AWS. I just grab the secret and deploy a private package from my local laptop. So we are 20 years after, and we want that world full of DevSecOps who looks like this, but it's not. And the answer of how could we streamline our CI CD deployment, uh, I'll call it launch facility because I like <laughs> rockets. So the answer for that could be complex, not this one. A uh, new word came in called GitOps. Now, there is no easy way to explain what GitOps is, <laughs> okay? <laughs> but I like challenges. So I said the goal of GitOps is to streamline all our deployment processes, that's a right word, processes, right? Yeah, into a place where we can get always one point of truth to what we are deploying. 
to what happened in production or whatever environment is that. Okay? Instead of having many, many pipelines, CI, CD, you know that picture? That's from one vision. So they have like the mic, which is GitOps. <laughs> so instead of having many, many pipelines and CI, CD processes, et cetera, we want to have a way to archive one point that we can be sure will always know what is in production. And again, whatever we call production. And the good news, you're already halfway there. And the reason for that is because uh, you have already some automated CI CD tools. You already done some uh, kind of actions that automate the way uh, um, to production. So what we left is actually to have a better way to streamline it. So instead of developers that say, we pushed the change to production, the key to streamline is to say, we pulled the change to production. If we are taking an, our environment or a job that run beside the environment, and instead of pushing changes to environment, we are letting the environment pull our changes, we can streamline all our processes. So no permission for anyone to push changes. We don't use that word anymore. We are creating jobs with service account or whatever very safe secret that no one can use outside of those um, environment or agent or, or sidecar. We'll go to uh, implementation details later. And instead of pushing, we are pulling. So that's the secret for GitOps and streamlining all our CI CD into one secure deployment process. If you are in the cloud native world, you already know Argo CD or Flux, and let's go to implementation. So how does both work? Because Kubernetes is a very granular um, orchestration. I don't know the word because that. Like. <laughs> uh, you can have agent that run as a side of your Kubernetes cluster and pulling the changes. And this is actually what we want to duplicate in any kind of environment we run. Even if that uh, package registry, like Docker registry, we don't want the CI CD to push it there. We want it run, track some code changes, and only then pushing that, uh, pulling that to the registry. And the reason for that is that if we are having a direct line from pushing code to repository into the package registry, we are getting deployment process. And we want someone or something that will track changes in our production branches or whatever branch it is and pull that to the registry. Same principle of Argo and Flux. Another point that we want for GitOps is having the pattern of inversion of control. So we know inversion of control from code and especially from libraries that have extensive um, logic, complicated logic, that they don't want anyone get involved inside. And the same as we do in code, we want our deployment processes to be immutable. We don't want them for every deployment to change something. We want the option to control all the process as code. And if I want to change something in the process, if, you, if I want to change something in the way we are pulling code into environment, I need to be immutable. So I cannot touch inside. And conceptually, that make me uh, I'll never made mistake because the question or the thing that I need to worry is not what is in production because what is in production can be harmful. We need to ask what should be in production. And doing that inversion of control, it's something that could very help us to archive this goal. Know every time what should be in production. So, how do we develop the GitOps? I mean, let's go to implementation. I'm pretty sure you already have some uh, idea on your head. So GitOps is more following a pattern. You can take your CI CD that you have today, and instead of having this last step of someone clicking a button and deploying something, have more pipelines, 
which are immutable in the conceptual immutable and instead of pushing pulling just inverse the control of the way you are pushing code that's the basic principle of github so some best practices that we learn along the way how to do good GitOps. So we do everything as code. That's important for many aspects, but if we do everything as code first, we can run tools on that. Uh, and also we can be immutable. We are also managing our Git infrastructure as code because uh, Terraform has provider for Git, GitHub and GitLab. So you can, instead of have your uh, super manager for GitHub organization, you're just managing a Git for Git with all the configuration for the GitHub account. And that help to have better permission for uh, instead of like the credential of FTP. Also, we want to create special uh, repository to be like an agent, agent that can pull in some different environment. If, if you look around, so uh, if you ever contribute to uh, open source, you can see that open source repository are always immutable for external changes. If you want to do external change, you are forking repository and then you are part of a release. And this is the same we want to do with our infrastructure. We want our repositories to be immutable, so we are creating like better branching mechanism and forking uh, repositories. Also, we have a principle. We are not allowing any kind of deploy anywhere. If we have like kind of deploy button, even for just a weekend, that means we have a backdoor for our, for our environment. And we are avoiding the concepts of end-to-end -end pipeline. The, there is a, a there is a pattern of having better pipeline by having them single responsibility. And that's a very important principle when you want to keep your CICD secure, having single responsibility for every um, job and pipeline uh, around. So I guess you love GitHub's, but it is safe enough because the controller still have the master key. That means Somewhere, there is someone that I cannot restrict their uh, access control to the environment. And you said, okay, but I have this spectacular DevSecOps and we spent three months just to build it. So those tools actually maybe help me, you know, that if I get to this point of deploying something, that should be safe. So that's true, but there is a problem in that model. So first, your developer is angry. And I know because I'm a developer, if, in, if my launch late in 30 minutes, I'm angry. If my code deployment late in five minutes, I'm even angrier than that. So that's the first problem. The second is efficiency, because uh, the GitOps is chaining pipeline. And you can potentially run and again and again the same tools that you already run in the first PR because you are keeping your pipelines separate, right? You're keeping them single source, uh, in single responsibility. So you're running them again and again. And not only that, because we have many types of uh, deployment for every deployment point, I do have redundancy checks. So for example, I do have environment in the US and environment in Europe. And then in Europe, I need some checks from GDPR, but in the US, I can send emails to people every day and I don't need those checks, right? So I do have a lot of redundancy checks just because uh, either redundancy checks, either redundancy deployments, right? Because that's always balancing between them. So what I need to do to add to GitOps to have better access control is having like a permission model. And now that I have that extensive uh, CI CD infrastructure, I want to start to act as my code is application itself. And the same, like I have a permission model like simple RBAC in my application, I would like to have it inside uh, my CI CD infrastructure. And that's time for policy engines. So what is policy engines? That's also something that came popular lately, again, because the cloud native and people run, want software that can run everywhere and whatever cloud it is, whatever cluster it is. And if we want to build efficient software that run everywhere, 
we need some side services that be granular to all those kind of software. And this is where policy engines came into the picture because we do have, for example, one application for the back office and one application for whatever front end. And we do have like infrastructure that we may have even customers that do, you know, deploy a complete environment themselves behind the scene. We need a good policy engine that we get a decision. We need one ring to rule them all to get any data and get any decision based on that. And there is two types for policy engine. The first one is called Google Zanzibar, which is kind of protocol uh, based on a graph DB that sits everywhere you want to put that. And we don't like it for GitOps because it should have state. I mean, Google Zanzibar in some manner is not a stateless engine. And we have the policy as code with the most famous one, Open Policy Agent. So what is Open Policy Agent? I don't know to explain what is Open Policy Agent. Either my company is based on Open Policy Agent, but I know what is the important part of Open Policy Agent. So the, fir the first one we can see in the left side, which is agent that get decisions and you can run everywhere. In the world of policy, it's called policy decision points, right? I want agent that I can put like, it can be a sidecar, a container sidecar, it can be a piece of software, it can be binary, but I want that everywhere I'll put this policy decision point, PDP in the jargon of uh, policy players. The PDP, wherever I put that, it will get the right decision. The second one is the way to configure the policy agents. And this is where the policy as code came. So here on the right side, and we go to back to that later, we see a new language called, not new anymore, called Rigo, and that help us to configure the rules for policy. And remember, the way to keep everything streamlined is to do everything as code. And this is actually what we have here. We need uh, these engines work great because we can streamline together our, our CI/CD, the way we are deploying environment, the way we, we are deploying packages, whatever it is, we can streamline it together with the code that do policy. So we have like policy rules. Uh, we, uh, we, for example, have one repository that include many, many queries to understand the permission we want to give for every deployment process. And then we streamline together the way we deploy and who can deploy. And we also have agent everywhere on the CI CD. Okay, so we have agent on our pipelines, we have agent on our uh, um, Argo. So agents are running uh, besides Argo and helping them getting uh, uh, decisions. So agents are everywhere. So, and a simple deployment works this way. So we have our queries that we can get decision on open policy agent uh, based on the data that came from uh, the CI CD. And we are writing queries and it's not that easy to write queries. You can go to, uh, there is a Rigo playground. You can go in the intro, just search for Rigo playground. And here we'll go better to that later, but we see we have input, which is the current uh, request. We have data, which is the whole state request, and we have the output. So what we want to archive is actually getting the option to get decision based on what we have on the PR or whatever entity now trying to be pulled in production. And how do we design this permission model? So that's not hard. The same RBAC as we have in our application. So the question when you are designing a, a permission model is those <clears throat> allowed to perform <clears throat> on, <clears throat> which is role, action, and resource. And the same we do on application, we can do also on CI CD. Those developer allowed to perform deploy to production environment. Okay, so role, developer, action, deploy, resource, production environment, right? And there is also more examples. I'll not just read it loud. And then we can write a simple policy document that say, 
the default allow false. Okay, so if it start here, it will be false, and then we are allowing it only if developer, if the user is developer, the action and the destination. Now you can see operation type, operation destination. That's because we have this data because this data exists on the PR. This data exists on the request. So when the GitOps controller wants to get a decision if they can pull or not a code to environment, they are asking uh, open policy agents. So they are giving requests and say, we have this scope of a uh, pulling request. Are we allowed or are we not allowed to deploy it to production? And based on that, getting streamlined decisions with uh, access control. But you say, what? How do you get all this data? Where is that all came from? And not only that, that's very simple. I mean, this one you can archive with any very, very simple declaration that say set of deployments, set of action, and that's all. And uh, you're right. The real permission model we need for CI CD is so called ABAC. What is ABAC? ABAC is like attribute-based access control. Instead of having that flat list of resource, action, and uh, role, action and resource, we have attributes everywhere. So what we want to do when we design our permission is knowing as much attribute that we can to get decision. So now we have uh, the option to get better decision because we can ask maybe that simple question, but we can ask even more complex question. And this way we get much smarter way for our GitOps controller to get decisions based on how the resource and the action that some initiator or maybe some job or maybe some role or identity with attribute trying to do. But then you ask, how you get this attribute, in the end you have maybe PR, in this PR you, you have five files of code that changed, you have maybe the approvals of the PR, how do you know what is the resource, how do you know if this code is critical, right, what does that mean critical, and what does that mean has public open APIs. And this is where I want to put here the 42, but I don't make joke twice. This is where static analysis come to help us. So if you already run any kind of uh, CI, CD or automation process, you already run, there is a lot of static analysis tools for every language, for everything. And the thing with static analysis is that we act them today as a binary factor. Is this code passed or failed? we don't look what the static analysis tells us. But if we, for example, taking the result of a static analysis run, we can get a real score about PR. So we can see here that we are importing a new library, right? And we can see that we are opening port for our application, and we can see that we are using uh, uh, environment variables. So we want to start to use static analysis not as a, a logic gate, we want to use that as a scoring engine. We want to start tag our PR, and that's, I mean, that strategy helps for many things. We want to start to score our PR, and that gives us a lot of intelligence on the way we are doing deployment. And you'll say, I don't think that's possible. But, that's quite simple. Sometimes memes work slow. And the way that's simple is because if you don't know how to create rules for static analysis, it looks hard. But there are many tools that can very easily to help you to configure a custom static analysis. Actually, mostly all of the static analysis tools allowing custom rules, but SAMGREP is even easier because SAMGREP has a playground that you can scan. And I'm not for SAMGREP. I didn't know that they will represent here. And this is open source. This is why I'm uh, showing it here. And here, for example, we can see a very simple rule that say, if we are using environment with value, we are want to score 
RPR. And then if we are running sometimes the static analysis tool, SEMGREP, on our pipeline, we can easily get score what happened in this PR. So this is a key for having better decisions on our PR. Start scoring them and tagging them and having them having our CI CD and our automatic deploy automatic deployment more intelligence on what happened on the resources we are trying to pull in production. And you look at me now and say, okay, fine, that's good ideas, but I have 10 steps in my CI CD and I have this policy agent that I don't have an idea how I'll run it, but that's seems fair. I'll, I'll find a way. And I have the GitOps controller. How do I connect all that dots? I mean, there is a lot of data that I spoke about here, but there is no easy way to connect all that. And the way to solve that is an open source tool. And we get back to my beloved open source tool, Opal, Open Policy Administration Layer. So... In short, what Opal do in the real world, in a world of application, so we have the open policy agent that usually run as a sidecar, but open policy agent is actually stateless. And also it should be very fast. So what Opal does, it's using a server client architecture to have better data and management for open policy agent. So you are running somewhere open policy, a uh, Opal server, which has data fetcher and also GitOps uh, capabilities to pull policy and data from Git, but also can fetch data. The uh, Opal client can fetch data. And this data can come from many sources. So here we can see, for example, things that are relevant to application like Salesforce or Stripe, but this data can also come from GitHub. Uh, or from the GitHub Actions, where we run our automatic um, processes. It can ca come also from uh, Circle CI if we are running our CI CD there. And we can have many data features. So if we are taking uh, Opa and instead of running it um, alone, we are running it inside Opal architecture we are getting better way to fetch and manage data. And that also has some smart caching algorithm to see that we are having the reliable data for every time we are trying to get policy decisions. And in this way, we are getting a full cycle of GitOps. We have the controllers on the right side, and we have OPA in the left side that help us to get decision. And we have OPA in the middle that help us um, to do a better GitOps. So thanks for that. And I know that was a lot of things to learn. And sorry that I didn't get a chance to show some more code that work and to upload some demo to GitHub. And I also know that you are waiting for answers, right? So I'm not sure who already. Uh, sorry. That's me. Let's see if we got any. Twitter answers. Oh, only one. Fine. Your end of life version, killing supply chain. It's always the supply chain. Again, if you don't want insecure application, do not deploy insecure application. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's all for today. If you have any questions at the time. Yeah. The Twitter thing. Uh, I, I two Sorry, sure. can you hear me? Yes. So, number one, why Rego? Like, what, what, what? Why that? Why nothing? Nothing normal or something that I've heard of, right? <laughs> it could just be me. And and number two, I, I, you haven't shown it here, but you said you know like this uh, pull concept for for the for the pipelines, right? And yeah. separating them out from environments, right? So currently, the the reason why the pipelines are set up like that is so any lunatic like me, oh, I can go in and see, oh, this is the stage, this is the stage, this is the stage, this is the stage. If I have to now go and, you know, check like four different pipelines, I, I'm kind of losing the context of what's going on, going where. So just, you know, yeah. am I correct or, or is there a, or is the pipeline still kind of? No, so the, the pipeline are actually the thing about GitOps is nothing with the code delivery itself. It's only with the deployment. 
that. Okay, it's not the integration side, it's the deployment side. Your pipelines, and let's go with the well-structured example of Argo CD, because that's a well-defined tool for GitOps, right? So all your pipelines stay the same. You can check every stage of your pip pipeline, what happened there and what's going there, because the only point where we want uh, uh, the GitOps data to be reliable is after we are getting to production. So think about it. You are doing all the integration yourself, but instead of delivering it to environment, you are delivering it to production, but as code, right? So your last version is code. From this point, no one in the organization has permission to touch it, right? And the only one who has permission is the GitOps controller, right? So in still in the integration, you can check everywhere you want. And why Rigo? Well, so I am living around Open Policy Agent since its first day, 2015, I guess. I, I implemented that in a network access controller. So I, I can't say that I love OPA, but back in the days, that was a kind of solution that bring so bright approach to a, um, something, to a problem that was stuck 30 years. So I think, you know, Maybe I'm not objective. I think from policy as code perspective, that's the best way to do policy. And the reason why I want the policy to be as code is just to keep the same immutable principle as the same as other GitHub. So the same I want to declare my environment as code, the same I want to declare my infrastructure as code, I want to declare my permission as code. Does that answer? Yeah, and Rigo, that's a good language. Go learn that. <laughs> Cool. Anything else? Cool. Thank you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so, um, and the question on the uh, pull versus push, right? So it's, yeah. it's all uh, very interesting for us in the AppSec industry because we all support the push pipeline, right? Where and it's we, pipeline which has stages, and obviously for us, one of the stages would be run static analysis, run, run dust, run all the security to find secrets in the code. If all this is clean, then only then pipeline allows to continue to go get to deployment. Mm -hmm. And God forbid any of these steps fail, we, we build the pipeline and say, we're AppSec, okay, all right, there's a security gateway, you're not going to production. So I've noticed obviously in your concept of pull instead of push, there is, of course, what you're doing instead looks like you're putting the results of the scans as attributes, right? So it's, a, it's an attribute thing. But my question there is, um, how do you actually deliver on the stages? I think kind of probably going back to the previous yeah, question so as well. Because obviously in the streamlined pipeline, it's easy to do this. If you want to split into separate pipelines and you're not going to break them, um, because everyone is used to breaking pipeline saying, okay, something's wrong, my build broke, I have to go back and fix it. If all pipeline stuff now runs successfully, how do we basically push that feedback back to developers saying there's a security issue, go fix it? Well, so let me ask you a question. And I was in the field of DevSecOps. What happened if your developer runs SAST tool and he got something that looked weird, but he don't understand how to fix that? And let's say that you are the only person who have the permission to skip that test. What happened then? Skip, yeah. skip the, the, well, right. it. Well, <laughs> it, it may happen, right? So they skip it. But then what you do, you, you introduce another one. You have a, a safety check just <laughs> before they try to deploy it. So it's very similar to your attribute thing. Definitely. Is, <laughs> they actually run it. Right. Yeah, so and I spent the last year on, on building orchestration of DevSecOps, so I know that that thing works. So again, for the integration, we are keeping the chain with pushing. That's fine. I mean, the only place where we start pulling is again on the delivery. So the pipeline after the code delivered continue to run autonomously by the checks. The only thing changed that because we have now the attributes, because we are doing static analysis and we can get decisions, we may even get our DevSecOps better because if the dust dynamic, okay, take one hour, which is the 
and we can skip dust because this code has only CSS changes or this code has nothing important to run API security tools on that because it don't include APIs. So the way we are, maybe I just was, you know, too aggressive with the pooling, but that wasn't my mean. I mean, the pooling is at the point of the deployment. We want to streamline the deployment processes, not the integration. The integration, I feel they are fine, except we need to have better permissions and decision model on the integration. Because today, as you know, the, 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 the orchestration could take a lot of time and also be hard to uh, developers to understand. So as your question, I think this push, this chaining of pass, 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 fail, stop here, go back, that thing that you know, that continue. And you have the same pipelines as you have before. But the last step, the last that today most of the organization has like that deploy button that only VP engineering can click on, this one we want to eliminate. At this point, we want to start pulling. Thank you. So a question from me then, and just on that. So, so what's the, the final permission to do that pull? Is that a, a, you know, green lights on your uh, automated deployment pipelines. What what gives that? If the developer is going to hit the deploy button, mm -hmm. what replaces that decision? So where developer usually that's deploy buttons that we have today. The only decision it takes is the credentials of the user who click on that. So from the architectures that I know. There is one or two or five users, GitHub users, that allowed to see and click this deployment button. We don't have more intelligence to get, uh, we can, I mean, GitOps is not a must. You can have these uh, policy engines somewhere in this pushed stage, and instead of showing this button, have it automatically, and this automatic process will check who initiate that. But the point I try to have, and this is why I showed the fuzzy line, the way we are moving, these credentials, this password of the users that we are trusting them to deploy policy, that's not reliable. I mean, what do I care how this person who deploy codes looks like? Because he has higher salary and he's afraid about his job, he will not deploy insecure code. No, that's not the picture. So what I want to avoid is having this binary decision on the deployment button. And even if you're keeping deployment button, you can have better decision if to show them and enable them. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. I think we're back.